available and clean is our best, cheapest, and most reliable local water supply. Now, unfortunately, the demand on the water is so great here, so many people. There's 2.4 million people living on top of the groundwater basin in northern Orange County. And they're getting two-thirds of their water, roughly, it changed over the years, from the groundwater basin. So to keep up with the demand, we've had to go a lot of water recycling. And we want to talk tonight about the project we've already got going and what we're doing as the next phase. But for four, almost four years now, since January of, nine, of 2008, we've had our big groundwater replenishment system working to produce local water to put back in the groundwater basin. Now we're taking treated waste water from the sanitation district, which was on your agenda by accident tonight, but they're very important because they're our partners in this. They're right next door to us in Fountain Valley. They take your wastewater, treat it to secondary level, good enough to put in the ocean, but instead of wasting that water in the ocean, we take <coughs> it next door and treat it to almost distilled water quality. And that's the replenishment system and that water we put back in the groundwater basin to keep up with the demand and keep that water available. Now, <coughs> since 2008, January, we've been doing this large new system, the largest of this kind in the world. And it's had tremendous performance, no problems, tremendous quality, but the demand is still creeping up. So we are now launching an expansion of that already very large project. And Mr. Marcus, our general manager, is going to give you the details on that and tell you what's ahead and ask for your understanding and support on what we're doing in your behalf. So thank you very much, Mr. Mike Marcus. Thank you very much, Director Anthony, and thank you, uh, City Council, for having us here this evening to talk a little bit about our plans for the future with the Groundwater Replenishment System Project. So I do have a presentation here, and I thought what I'd briefly do is uh, go over. Director Anthony uh, did explain uh, what the Orange County Water District does, and we serve the 19 cities in north and central Orange County. So if you overlie the basin, you can pump groundwater as a portion of your water supply. And our board of directors actually sets that amount of percent, uh, that percentage of pumping every April. We're a non-adjudicated basin, so the amount of pumping can vary out of the basin. And it's varied over time from 65% to a high of about 82%. Currently, it's at 65%. So 65% of, uh, of the city's water supply comes directly out of the ground. The other 35% has to be purchased from the Metropolitan Water District. And they are the uh, imported water wholesaler in this area. Now, the important key there is we charge $254 an acre foot for groundwater whereas metropolitan water costs about $800 an acre foot, and it's going up to $850 an acre foot as of January the 1st. So the more we can pump out of the ground, the better off we are here in Orange County as far as an overall cost of water supply. As far as the district or our operational facilities, we actually start up behind Prado Dam. And I'll talk a little bit earlier about our stormwater capture behind Prado. We also own about 2,200 acres of land. We have 400 acres of constructed wetlands behind uh, Prado where we naturally treat the uh, half the flow of the Santa Ana River to reduce the nitrates in the water. It then comes downstream into Anaheim and Orange where we have about 1,200 acres of recharge facilities in those areas. So up in Orange is where we have pri our primary percolation uh, capacity. That's where a lot of the water from all of the water from the Santa Ana River is captured. We also pump about half the water from the groundwater replenishment uh, system also up into that area and percolate it into the ground. And then we're just down the uh, 405 in Fountain Valley where we have our facilities and we, we've been there since the mid 70s. We have a seawater barrier which is very important to the basin was developed in the mid 70s to keep seawater intrusion from coming inland and contaminating the groundwater basin. So what is the groundwater replenishment system, or re we refer to it as GWRS? It's a new 70 million gallon per day advanced water purification facility. Uh, it takes sewer water that otherwise would be wasted to the ocean, runs it through an advanced process, uh, turns it into near distilled quality water, and then that becomes a source of supply to the groundwater basin. Uh, it prov provides a new 72,000 acre feet uh, per year source of water, which is enough water for nearly 600,000 people. And as Director Anthony mentioned, it's been operational since January 2008. Why do we need GWRS? I think we're all aware of the, uh, uh, the problems we have with imported water. We get a, uh, Metropolitan gets about half their water from Northern California. That's been limited because of environmental decisions. Also, the other half they get from the Colorado River, and they're known to have extended droughts. So it really is a variable source of supply that we have as far as imported water is concerned. And anything we can do to provide local reliability, we feel is key. 
Uh, so local projects lessen that dependency on those outside sources. How does GWRS work? Uh, we use a process uh, which is microfiltration, reverse osmosis, followed by UV light with hydrogen peroxide. And the microfiltration uh, very effectively removes any bacteria, protozoa, or suspended solids in the water. It's followed re by reverse osmosis, which really is the workhorse of the treatment process. And reverse osmosis will remove any dissolved minerals, viruses, or pharmaceuticals, most importantly, in the water. Uh, there are some very, very low molecular weight organics that do get through the reverse osmosis, and that's where the final process comes in, the UV light with hydrogen peroxide, and that destroys all those trace organics in the water. So it really is the highest quality of water in the region. As far as proven reliability, uh, as, as, as has been mentioned, we've been online for nearly uh, four years. We'll be celebrating our fourth birthday on January the 18th. And uh, we have to test for over 400 compounds at, per our permit. And in all cases, uh, we are not detecting anything in the water. We have to test for over uh, 28 volatile organics. We're finding all those compounds non-detect. You go right down the list, uh, 10 unregulated chemicals, all but one, and that's boron. Uh, we can remove that to about half, 50% of the permit level. Uh, 16 endocrine disrupting chemicals and pharmaceuticals, all non-detect. So the system does work, and in fact, it's being replicated in other areas around the world, uh, primarily based on the success of this project. So the benefits of the project are is we're creating a new water supply. We're reusing a wasted resource. We consider wastewater a, uh, a resource. Uh, increases water supply reliability. Uh, costs less than imported water, and of course that's a key because we, we want to make sure that we have the most cost-effective water supply that we can. Saves half the energy over imported water. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to move water from Northern California down to Southern California, and we can do it at half the energy. We can also do it for half the energy that it takes to desalinate seawater. So we want to recycle as much as we can. and. It improves the water quality of the basin. Uh, the uh, groundwater basin actually has fairly high mineral content uh, called TDS, total dissolved solids. And the water that comes out of this facility has very, very low mineral content. So over time with the blending of those two waters, we'll see the overall mineral content of the groundwater decreased, which will uh, help all of us. So what's next? And that's really what we came here to talk to you about. Uh, Right after we went online with the original project, the board said, go ahead and take a look at expanding it. So we actually designed uh, our expansion, and uh, we're expanding to 100 million gallons. So we're going from 70 million gallons to 100 million gallons. We've designed the project. We've awarded a contract to McCarthy Constructors for $115 million, uh, and will be complete in three years. So in three years from now, or shortly, uh, thereafter, we will have an additional 31,000 acre foot per year source of water supply for the groundwater basin, which was, is enough water for about another quarter million people. So very, very significant. As far as the cost of the water, we thought we'd throw this in, of course, just to, uh, to see where we're at. The, the current project we can produce for about $480 an acre foot. Uh, so last year we produced 66,100 acre feet of water out of the existing facility at $480 an acre foot, still well below the cost of imported water, which as I mentioned before was 800 to 850. Our expansion uh, we're going, is going to cost us about $579 an acre foot. Now with the origi original project we received about $92 million in grant funding. The grant funding isn't there for the expansion. But the water is so valuable. We need that additional supply of, of uh, water to the basin so we can maintain high pumping rates because the more the cheap water we can pump, the lower the overall cost of water supply is going to be. So $579 an acre foot for the expansion, or if you take the two together and what, what I call a melded cost, that cost would be about $512 an acre foot. The other thing I wanted to do is talk about stormwater capture. And the Water District has uh, had relationships with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and MO, MOAs with them, Memorandums of Understanding, to actually store water behind Prado, Prado Dam. So during the winter time, we can store up to a certain elevation, and that's elevation 498. And that equates to about 9,300 acre feet of water. So we store that water during the winter, and then we can slowly release it, capture it. 
Uh, if it goes over that, that amount, then the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers will quickly release it down to that elevation. So a lot of times you'll see water in the Santa Ana River down the 405 after a storm, and that's because they're lowering the amount of water behind Prado down to elevation 498. And then they'll slow down the discharge and we can capture that water. Now during the spring it goes up to elevation 505 during the spring and summer. The problem is, is there isn't any water behind the dam during the spring and the summer. So what we're trying to do uh, with the Army Corps again is to change the MOA such that we can store water behind Prado Dam to elevation 505 year round. So if we can get them to allow us to store water during the winter to elevation 505, it'll uh, mean that we can store up to 20,000 acre feet. So instead of the 9,300, we can capture 20,000 acre feet of water. So that's uh, uh, about 10,700 additional acre feet of water for every storm that comes in during the winter. And a lot of times we're able to capture several storms. If we have early rainfall, it raises up, we can drain the pool. Another storm comes in, we can fill it up again. So with this initiative, we can actually capture, we believe, between 10,000 and 30,000 acre feet of water per year. And all we have to do is change their operating manual. There's no additional construction involved with this. It's a fairly simple change. Uh, however, uh, when working with the core, you're working uh, at a different speed and unfortunately it's going to take us according to uh, the way they've laid things out about 51 months to accomplish this uh, but we need to do it quickly and we need to do it as soon as possible because this is a free source of water this is water that if they don't hold it it goes right past us to the ocean so it's a very very important initiative for us and for all of Orange County and the Orange County groundwater basin so what we're asking uh, uh, tonight of the council is letters of support, uh, two letters of support. First of all, uh, in support of our expansion project and secondarily in su uh, support of our additional stormwater capture at Prado Dam. And that ends my presentation. This is a little aerial of the, uh, of the water <coughs> district. If uh, you haven't been by to take a tour of the facility, we would certainly invite you to stop by and tour the facility. Uh, we're very proud of it. It's the largest of its type in the world. It's an extremely significant water supply project. So uh, Director Anthony and I would both be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great, thank you. Let's bring it back to the uh, council. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Edgar, do you have any questions? No. <clears throat> Director Anthony, I would uh, just thank you for coming down. I, uh, as being on the Sanitation District, I have a lot of opportunity to work with uh, your organization, and uh, your board's doing a great job. I think that a um, <coughs> big part of the partnership here was the Sanitation District uh, provides the water that gets sent through the GWRS, right. and uh, you know the <coughs> you know from the board's perspective on on that board, everybody's very supportive of this uh, project and to be able to do the expansion. Uh, for the community, I'd make sure that uh, everybody has a little bit of a, uh, an understanding of a point of reference. Something that you're not aware of is we're in the middle of having issues with Golden State Water right now. So we've had a couple council meetings where the communities come in and spoke. And I just want to differentiate is that uh, you guys are the ones that are actually charging the water basin, uh, you know, and Golden State Water is the one delivering. And I think we're on the delivery as an issue for, for you know, water right now. And I don't want to confuse that with your project because uh, we think this is a great project. Good distinction. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're sort of a wholesaler that supplies the water to the basin. <coughs> Golden State is a retail they pump it out and deliver it to your homes yeah yeah well that's all I have thank you all right thank you very much you know and I'm, I'm next on the rotation so I've got a question for you you said that two-thirds of the water uh, that we are using currently is from this groundwater replenishment program exactly it's actually 65 percent this year but it's been up about averaging two-thirds or more so by showing us savings on this, reu reusing water is different, uh, different suppliers like Golden State should benefit from this, correct? Well, they do, because the more groundwater they can pump, the less imported water they buy, and the imported water is uh, more than double the price. Good. I just uh, wanted to hear you say that again. So Well, that's, <laughs> that's true, and that's certainly part of the cost of the water itself, but other costs come in in them distributing the water and the cost of providing it to your, to your public. So there's other costs included. But the water itself is much cheaper if you can pump it from the ground as opposed to importing it. 
Right. Now, the expansion of the capacity at Prado Dam, is the dam constructed for that? That dam's yes, been there yes, a long yes. time. What we're talking about is catching water at the end of a storm. It's when the peak of the storm is over, they can tell the rain's about to stop. Then they'll capture that water at the end of the storm and hold it and let it out slowly enough that we can run it down the river and put it in the ground. In a full storm flow, it goes right past us to the ocean. So that's basically free water, and it's at the end of a, of a storm when it's safe. Because the number one purpose of Prado Dam is flood protection. That they've got to do that first. So this is done with cooperation with us and with weather forecasting. So it's done when it's safe to do it. If it comes, if another storm sneaks in too fast, they'll just open the gates and let the water go out fast. All right, but it, it's, it's a wonderful source of extra water for, for you, for us. Good. One last question. Uh, how long is that percolation process before it goes from replenishing the groundwater to it hits our taps at home? Is there any way of determining yes, that? Yes, it is. It depends on where you are and where the nearest well is, but it's a matter of months, sometimes years, from when it goes percolating down to the ground to the lower aquifers, and it moves horizontally more or less to the southwest toward the ocean, and it could be uh, several months, if not several years, before it's actually pumped out. It cannot be instantly that there's a requirement by the health department that it be at least a certain length of time. Very good. So it, it does, it's, it's a nice process. So it really goes through the natural process yes, considerably. Yes, extra process of underground percolation through the soils and the, and the sands and the aquifers. All right, thank you. All right, moving on, uh, Council Member Mejia. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for coming tonight. <coughs> I've been lucky enough to um, attend one of your tours, and it's very interesting. And if you wouldn't mind answering this question, aren't you a cutting edge um, facility e even throughout the, the world? I mean, how many more are there like you? Well, we've been cutting edge for a long, long time. Uh, even before my time on the board, and I've been there quite a while, mm -hmm. the first large R RO plant, reverse osmosis in the world, was Water Factory 21 in 1975-76. It was only five million gallons a day, but that was at the first big RO factory in the entire world. Now, we've just enlarged it to a whole new level, right. but uh, this is the largest of its kind, indirect potable use in the world, and we're going to expand it further. Okay. Now, there are other plants of different kinds that don't do quite the same thing, but uh, th this is a very, and it, it's, a, it's world famous. We've won awards right. worldwide, and people come from all over the world to tour the plant right. and let them go home and try to copy it. Yeah. And, and, and they do at, at a small Well, when you state. do something right, I think that's what people do. Why recreate, right, why recreate the wheel? Um, one of the things that I remember on the tour also was that you clean the water so purely that you actually have to add things back into it. Is that correct? Are you, you still doing you that? You had a good tour. You did a good <laughs> tour. <laughs> I listened. No, that's true because this, this process makes water this almost distilled water. Mm -hmm. And very pure water, if you try to run it through normal pipes, it's so aggressive it dissolves material out of the pipes. So we actually add a little bit of lime to it, sodium uh, ox hydroxide to give it just a little bit of mineral content so it's not so aggressive in the pipes. Great. Uh, I it did tastes have a very good, too. You probably drank it. I tried it, yeah. It was very good. It's actually better than bottled water, but I hate to say that. Um, now, you said uh, with regards to grant funding that there would not be grant funding available this time around. Where will that money be coming from since we aren't having access to that funding? Well, there's, we've got $1 million in grants so far, but last the first time because it was such an important pro program that both the state and the federal right. uh, people did donate uh, quite a bit of grant money. But in these days, there's not much money well, around. But we, we yeah. pay the most of the cost by just borrowing the money ourselves and picking it up out of the, the charges that we put on the pumpers to pump it out. So it's, it's paid by the ratepayers themselves. If I may. No. Uh, <laughs> we, we also did receive a state revolving fund loan on a majority of the of the projects, so uh, an SR, SRF loan or state revolving fund loan is actually 2.6 percent money over a 20-year period. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were able to finance the project through those low-interest uh, loans from the state. Well, the reason I ask is because the last time we supported this, there was some controversy over the raising of the rates for the residents. So do we have any kind of scale so that the residents would know what to expect? And I know last time, I believe it was over four years, it was, you know, not a great deal of money, but still, just so that we're up front with them now. Yeah, Mike has, I think, a okay. number. Okay, thanks, Certainly. Mike. Certainly. Yes, uh, we plan on raising our rates uh, by $36 an acre foot. 
over the next four years. Uh, so $36 an acre foot, an acre foot is enough for uh, two families of four. So that's about $18 a year okay. for a family, so okay. about $1.50 a month. Okay, per family. That's that's what I was looking for. Just because I know last time I think it was, if I remember correctly, it was like four dollars and then two and then two and then nine. It was the the final year. Are you looking in the same amount of time, a four year span, to be able to pay off the costs of this? I'm not sure where the four year. Remember that? Uh, well, we're we're going to increase our rates over a four year period, four year. Okay. and then. Yeah. Th then that'll be it. So all the operations and maintenance costs, the capital costs will be rolled into that. Okay. Uh, we'll actually pay off the project in 20 years. In 20, okay. The capital costs. Okay. I'm sorry that I, I you know, like I said, I, I'm talking from about two or three years ago, so I apologize if it's not clear. But the point is, as you're making, I think that the by the time you get to the cost of the individual homeowner user, it's very, very small. Very minimal. Very yes, small. exactly. That yeah. it, It's more and of an it in support for you. It normally saves the homeowner because it means they can use more of the groundwater and less imported water. Exactly. So it's usually a net saving. Exactly. And then my last is just kind of a question uh, with regards to the um, capture at the Prado Dam. Do we know, can you explain to us why at the most it's 505 feet and, um, <laughs> and is there room for more expansion beyond <laughs> that? Well, it's that number because we've negotiated that number over many years starting in the mid 80s with the Corps of Engineers. Okay. It's gradually been moved up a little bit. But these numbers are based on the old dam. And it's safe to do it at those levels with the old dam. Now the dam, dam has been raised, mm -hmm. but they haven't raised the spillway yet because they've got to do some other things to be able to use the new dam. But this increase to 505 year round is entirely safe with the old dam. Right. And it was based on calculations on that. Do we have any idea once the new the dam is complete and it's all up to you know the higher level of expectation for the Army Corps? Do we have an idea of how much we might be able to retain then? Should you be able to meet with success dealing with them? We hope we will go up when the new dam is fully finished. You know what the number is that? What's the last one we had? Uh, it's. I think we're looking at going from elevation 505 to elevation 512. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've studied that. Water. Huge amount of water. Okay, great. That's all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. Councilmember Kuzumoto. Thank you, and uh, thank you for appearing here and uh, giving this uh, presentation. Somebody asked another question on cost. How, how I, I imagine these things are energy intensive. So how, how sensitive uh, the price of your um, pumping the water into the ground sensitive to uh, energy costs? If energy doubles, what will that do? Quite a bit. So am I okay. going to Yes, that's a good point. That is a good point. The, the process uses reverse osmosis, and the, and the RO uses the amount, uh, the, the largest amount of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it accounts for about a third of our O&M costs. Uh, so in in your scenario if uh, say energy doubled uh, it would probably affect the overall cost by about 20 percent mm -hmm. okay and the other question on the uh, the the brine that comes out of the RO process the uh, byproduct where does that go it goes back over to the sanitation district and oh, okay. out there piped the ocean okay but it's how I guess uh, what's in it well it's uh, all the dissolved salts and minerals and chemicals that were in the water. But remember, this is nothing like uh, desalinating seawater. Uh, sewer water is not very salty. Okay. It's only like about 1,000, 1,100 parts per million dissolved solid. Seawater is 35,000 mm. parts per million of salt. So the brine we're getting is a very dilute brine. Mm -hmm. has virtually no impact on... on but you had on there like pharmaceuticals and um, uh, other type of um, things. How, how much... How, what's the content of of dissolved drugs in the brine that you uh, discharge. Do you actually, do you measure that? It's, it's very we don't little. really measure it. It's a very, very small percentage. However, keep in mind, we're not adding anything that would not have gone to the ocean anyway. What, whatever was in the wastewater would have gone to the outfall, maybe slightly less concentrated. Right, a little more concentrated. So the only thing we're doing perhaps is adding to the concentration <coughs> that's being uh, discharged into the ocean. But by the time they've done studies and they found that by the time it gets about a foot away from uh, the diffusers and the outfall that it's totally dispersed. Okay. Thank you. No other questions? Thanks. All right. Councilmember Pope. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much.
I haven't seen you for a long it's been a time, Mr. Hasn't it? <laughs> right? Thank you for coming. Um, uh, some excellent questions asked. I think it's been covered, and thank you. Very good um, demonstration here. And for anyone in the community that has not been there, um, I urge you to go. They're willing to take you on a tour, and it really is uh, quite something to see. That's so a wonderful point. I'm glad you made that because we want to extend the invitation to the council members and the city folks, but we have tours of anybody, any right. citizens that want to come and tour us, just give us a call and we will set it up for you. In small groups or large groups, we're more than happy to have you. Well, yes. and it is, it's almost overwhelming, uh, the magnitude of it and what's accomplished there. So thank you so much for bringing thank this to, uh, to our council and to our city so that people can be informed about it. Thank you. Thank you. It was good to see you again. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> All right, moving on, we will go to item six, oral communication. At this time, any individual in the audience may come forward and speak on any, any item within the jurisdiction and subject matter of the city council. Remarks are to be limited to no more than five minutes per speaker. And uh, I would ask the city manager if you would keep a list of any questions that could be responded to after oral communications. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Jay Meibler. I would like to take a moment to clarify Mr. Edgar's continuous false statement <coughs> from the dais. Citizens for a, fair con for a Fair Trash contract couldn't do anything until after the contract was put in place. The date was June 21st, 2010. Over the next two months, citizens looked at their legal options and for competent legal counsel willing to take the case under the Private Attorney General Act. Then they had to create citizens' legal entity, citizens' bank accounts, and all the normal things associated with creating a legal entity. Then they had to work with the attorney and his schedule, get all their ducks in a row, and validate all claims in the complaint. Finally, they had to file the complaint. By then, it was 10 2010 four months from nothing to a filed complaint in the Superior Court. Considering everything else that was going on at the time, and the citizens actually have to work, make a living, raise families, etc., that was really very good time. So please, stop your lies about it being political. It was done just as fast as it could have been done considering what had to be done in order to do it right and win. Now I get five minutes to tell the truth, but you get to repeat the same tired old lie over and over because repetition of a lie makes it seem like a truth. But it's not, Mr. Edgar. You and three other council members are not tar were not targeted politically. You were targeted because you violated the city municipal code and gave the exclusive solid waste franchise agreement to someone other than the lowest responsible bidder. Now, on to Mrs. Poe's complaint that she doesn't like being called a criminal. Municipal code 1.20.010 is really simple. It's a catch-all that sets a standard for violation of municipal code where no specific penalty is provided therefore. The violation of any such provision of such code or any other ordinance of the city or such rule, regulation, or order shall be punished by a fine not exceeding $500 or imprisonment for a term not exceeding six months or by both such fine and imprisonment. That's the actual code. Judge Banks stated, and I quote, the petitioner, Citizens for a Fair tra Trash Contract, have established that the respondent, City of Los Alamitos' award of the contract for the provision of solid waste services dated 21, June 21, 2010, in favor of the respondent, Consolidated Disposal Services, failed to comply with Los Alamitos Municipal Code sections 8.12.015 and 2.60 at SEC, which required that the contract for solid waste services be awarded to the lowest responsible bidder, end quote. So we have three, a vote by three city, sitting city council members to violate the municipal code. Seems to be a clear-cut case. But surely Judge Banks also stated that a city council member's vote is free speech and cannot be gagged. And I agree. But that doesn't mean that by making such a vote, the council member is not violating the law. How can that be? 
Well, for example, there is a law that says a council member cannot participate in a vote where they get a one penny of personal benefit. When a council member chooses to vote in violation of that law, their vote while an act of free speech is a violation of the law and the FPPC does fine council members for making such votes and worse. In other words, violating the law with your vote while protected speech can also be criminal. Since we have a, a, a case of precedence for a vote that was legal to be punished and we have a court ruling the saying the vote by the council members violated the municipal code and we have a law that says the violation of the municipal code is a misdemeanor. That means we have a case where Mrs. Poe, Mr. Egger, Mr. Stevens, and Mr. Zarcos participa participated in a criminal act. What we don't seem to have is anyone willing to forward the criminal complaint to the city of Los Alamitos as prosecuting attorney for action. I believe the person that should have done this over a month and a half ago is the city manager who works on behalf of the people. But now I am voicing my complaint and asking the city manager directly, before you leave for your new job in Bellflower, to forward the complaint to the city's prosecuting attorney for criminal filing. Either there is a rule of law or there isn't. Mr. Egger, you're running for Congress um, as, a, as a Republican. And we know the Republicans are big believers in the rule of law. Remember President Clinton? So I know I can count on Mr. Egger to see to it the city manager properly refers this to the city's prosecuting attorney for appropriate legal action. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Jody Schloss, a resident of Los Alamitos. Um, I want to talk about a couple of different things. First of all, I'd like to um, <clears throat> I'd like to say thank you for the residents of the Highlands to Jerry Mejia, Councilwoman Jerry Mejia to the city manager and to the public works department for putting the fence up in Orville Lewis Park. That's much appreciated. I, it looks great. It was done in such a short amount of time and to have it actually come forward and be done the same year is pretty much unheard of. But because of the safety, because of the coyotes, I really appreciate it. Um, and I, I think everybody else appreciates it too. And for listening to the residents that they didn't want a wall, they wanted the chain link so they could continue to look at the base and, and uh, we appreciate that. Um, secondly, I would like to ask, I, I don't know if I need to talk individually to council members to see if I can request this of the city manager, but I'd like to see now that they have on the website, the city's website, you list the, um, the salaries for the directors and things like that. And I'm wondering if you could expand, expand that to mean also the, um, to add the council members when they sit on boards and commissions and committees. Everybody up there has a chance to um, be on different commissions. And I know that they're paid per meeting. Some of them don't pay anything. Some of them pay $100, $125 to go to these meetings. And I'd like to see exactly the commissions that we belong to the council members that are on these commissions and exactly what they're paid per meeting to go to these. I think this is something that would be um, beneficial to the public. It would just be transparency, another form of transparency. And I don't know why any of the council members would object to that. So if I can't do that as a resident, I am asking one of you or all of you to ask your city manager to look into that and see that that can be done maybe before the end of the year. I know probably after the first of the year, you'll be picking new people to be on new commissions, and so it would be beneficial to have that in place ahead of time. <coughs> and then I have a question for um, Vice Mayor, um, Mayor Pro Tem, Edgar. Uh, I know you sit on the Sanitation District. Thank you for, it was probably you who brought the presentation forward today about the uh, Sanitation District and the, the water. Uh, what they're doing to for the second phase and all of that for the for the water and I I appreciate that I supported it a few years ago when it started and I still support it um, I also know that in September you voted in a closed session that was actually a Brown Act violation on the sanitation district you voted a yes vote for a pay raise that I, I don't have a problem with raising our our fees a little bit to do the secondary treatment for the water. But I do have a problem because of the economy and the way people, there's a lot of people that don't even have jobs. And I do feel that employees should be grateful that they have a job right now. 
I know before I retired, uh, there was a downturn in the economy, and my wages were frozen for a couple of years, and I was just glad to have my job. So um, at the sanitation district, I, I have a question, and I know you can't respond to me now, but maybe during your council comments you could respond, and you could let us know why in September you voted yes for the pay raise when it was a closed-door session, but yet last week you voted and you changed your vote to no, you don't want to give them a raise now. So if you could explain that uh, later in the, the meeting, that would be appreciated. And I won't be here, but I'll be watching you at home. Thank you, and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <coughs> Seeing no additional speakers, we're bringing it back to the council now. Uh, city manager, do you have a response on anything, or the city attorney? I don't have a response to at the moment. All right, thank you. Any others will be uh, responded to uh, during uh, council comments. We're going to move on to item number seven, register of major expenditures. Can we please have a roll? I'm sorry, yeah, roll call. First of all, I'll move it. Second. Roll call. Councilmember Graham Mejia? Yes. Councilmember Kusumoto? Aye. Councilmember Poe? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Edgar? Aye. Mayor Stevens? Yes. All right. Moving on to item number eight, consent calendar. All consent calendar items may be acted upon by one motion unless a council member requests a, a separate action on a specific item. You have to excuse me, I'm still getting used to my new glasses, and every time I look sideways, it gets blurry. Do we have any uh, requests? I'd like to pull item A. Any? The remainder. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No opposed. And uh, Council Member Mejia? Thank you, Mayor. Um, just the same opposition that I have each uh, council meeting. Sorry to make extra work for you, Wendy, but um, I'd just like it noted for the record. Uh, the standard uh, problem I have with these is they're incomplete and they are historically um, not of use for future councils because they are so um, sparse in their content. Thank you. Mayor, if I may. Go ahead. So um, uh, for page, I'm not sure what page that's on, page seven, during the uh, mayor and council initiated business on uh, my statements, if you can uh, stop it, that I reported my attendance at the uh, CP, uh, CJ, PI, um, California Joint Powers, yeah, uh, Insurance Authority Risk Forum, and then just leave it at that and delete the rest of that part. I'd appreciate that. All right, do we have a motion on that? I'll move approval of item A. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. All right. That's the end of the consent calendar. We're going to go on to discussion item. Uh, a, consideration of City Council holiday meeting schedule. And uh, City Manager, would you please give us a presentation on this? For the past two years, the Council has traditionally canceled this meeting. It's a thin staff uh, with several days off between the Christmas and uh, New Year's holidays. This year, the New Year holiday falls on the second, which would push the meeting back to the third. So what we're really looking for is to, uh, we're recommending that we cancel the meeting of what would be January the third. 2012 uh, because of the thin staff and the lack of number of folks that will not be around uh, during that holiday period and we just recommend approval all right is there any discussion on that council member Agder? uh question so december 5th uh council member poe are you in town out of town i remember seeing something on that i'm out of town yeah. okay <clears throat> 
So uh, city manager, December 5th, December 19th, what are some of the important items that are going to be coming uh, policy-wise? I noticed the one item in consent was uh, continued. Do you anticipate uh, that? Correct. The two big policy? items coming back are that one and then the reorganization of the city council, which comes the first meeting in December. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't have any questions other than that. I guess I'd be uh, supportive of the... Uh, the calendar items for January 3rd to postpone that meeting. Okay. Um, I really don't think we have any choice on it either. So I'm also in favor of it. Council Member Mejia? Uh, I, I'm good with the staff recommendation. All right. Council Member Kuzumoto? Yes, I'm uh, good as well. I'm in favor of it. And Council Member Poe? Uh, I, think, I think we need a second. You need a motion, a second. Oh, we have a motion, okay, I believe. Okay, second. Do we have second. a motion? I don't have a motion. Okay, I'll make oh. a motion to go with the stack, staff recommendation for the, um, sorry, I turned the page already, uh, holiday calendar. I'll awesome. second it. All right. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, going on to item B, Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement Number 54, Fund Balance Classification. And we have a report on that. Yeah, Ms. Agramonti will make that presentation to you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. This is the GASB 54 fund balance classification policy. Um, GASB 54 established um, new fund type definitions and fund uh, balance categories. Um, this new standard does not change the total amount of fund balances in any given fund. It just um, rather focuses on the extent to which the city is, city is bound to honor um, certain constraints on these specific amounts. Um, there's basically two parts to this process. The first part we completed through the budget process, and that was um, where we addressed the different fund categories and recategorized some of the funds to meet the new um, classifications. And this would be the second part, looking at fund balance categories um, as we're in the process of pre preparing our CAFR for last fiscal year. Um, the current fund balance classifications are um, reserved, designated, and undesignated. Under GASB 54, five new categories have been established. Um, they are non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. And these are all des described in the um, staff report that's attached. Also in the staff report, there is a um, table that shows um, last fiscal year's financial statements and how those would be recategorized with the new um, descriptions. And um, with that, I'm open to any questions you may have. All right, let's bring it back to the council. Council Member Edgar. Yeah, I, I'm pretty familiar with this. So I, I don't think this is a very material difference uh, to GASB regulation of just trying to clarify uh, t really terms only. So um, yeah, I think you did a good job. I think in here also the detail on mapping was to what it will be is pretty straightforward. So I, I really don't have any issue with this. And, uh, and when we get to the point, I'd make the motion just to accept the staff recommendation. All right, and this is a, uh, basically a formality that we're uh, going through, and so um, that's the only comment that I really have on it. Councilmember Mejia? Nope. All right. Councilmember Kuzumoto? So, um, so on this one, it's just a simple mapping of the way it used to be called to the way it will be called. Right. Okay. Now, uh, the other thing that we spoke about at the, um, the risk management uh, conference about the um, reserve policy, did you ever have a chance to look into that? Perhaps we need to... Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at several different reserve policies, they're all over the board, as yeah. you might imagine. All because I, I, you yeah. know, I, I print out the Santa Ana City of Santa Ana yeah. study. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that, but you know, um, I think that what we have is a fairly conservative reserve policy, and and basically the the only real obligation we have is to make sure there's enough liquid so we don't run into a, a problem okay. paying bills and that sort of thing. But okay. that's something I think that we should probably and should address at the mid-year budget review. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No other questions. All right, Councilmember Pope. Um, I will second this. Okay. Recommendation. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none. All right, we're going on to item C, selection of a city representative to the Orange County Vector Control uh, 
district board of directors yeah, city believe, manager i believe each member of the council received a letter from the orange county vector control district board of directors saying the term currently occupied by mr ken parker is expiring december 31st of this year what the board is looking for is one of three actions and that would be to reappoint mr parker to a two or four-year term or to select a, a member of the current council to either a two or four-year term uh, staff is recommending that you select a member of the current council to either a two or four-year term very good all right, we're going to bring it back to the council again. Council Member Edgar. Yeah, uh, just a question to the rest of the council. Is anybody interested on the council and being on this board? I would be. I, I have some interest also. <clears throat> okay. Warren? No. Yeah, I have no interest in being on this board. I'd be supportive of having somebody on the city council support it, uh, sitting on it, and uh, I'll just listen to the rest of the discussion, but I would support uh, either way. Thank you. All right. I uh, also have no interest in on being on this board either. And so, uh, again, we will uh, go through the process and see, uh, see who we're going to pick. Council Member Mejia? Uh, I think I've expressed my interest. I wasn't sure if I okay. needed to do that at the time, so we didn't move forward with just thinking there was only one person interested. That's, that's fine. Council Member Kuzumoto. Um, so question for the uh, city manager on this one. This one pays a stipend. It does pay a stipend. I don't know how much it is. I haven't checked it in a long time. Um, okay. Does anybody know how much? hundred dollars a meeting, I believe. Okay. okay. And it meets monthly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Council Member uh, Graham Mejia for this uh, position. All right. Uh, we do have the nomination out there, but uh, let me move on and see what uh, Council Member Poe has to say. Uh, yes, I um, I would be interested in this position also, and um, I would recommend that we do it for a two-year term yeah. rather than the four. All right. Currently, we have one recommendation that uh, it be for a two-year term. Is there any discussion from anyone on that? If I might, Mayor, I, I think it's a great idea to go only the two-year term because uh, these usually the seats usually held by a council member and as elections go sometimes council members are not reelected and i think that uh it best serves the city if it's someone currently seated on the council so i think the two years probably the best way to go very good all right there's a motion right now for uh council member mejia to be on this commission i didn't hear a second was there a second to that motion i i have a question city attorney um, since this is a, um, a board or a commission that receives a stipend, which is over the 250 uh, allotted before you're no longer allowed to vote on it, does that also exclude me from seconding the motion? No, compensation from a governmental agency is exempt under the Political Reform Act, doesn't count towards your um, conflict rules, so you're free to vote on it. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and second it. Well, before you do that, Jerry, why don't we just have a little bit of an open discussion, if we might, Mayor? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think we have an opportunity here. I, I guess I would just kind of, since we are in front of the public, I mean, just have a little bit of a discussion. Um, you know, Jerry, you want to serve on this, w whatever the reasons, the purposes. Same with you, Marilyn. I mean, anybody have a really, really strong feeling? We do want to push it to a vote. Is there anything specifically that you guys want to achieve on being on the Vector Control Board? I, I got to tell you, I, I, I really want somebody that will actually come and give updates here. Mm -hmm. Let us know what's going on. Um, you know, some of the things that are important to me. Um, you know, there is a major move in the county on that board. It has $10 million in reserves. Um, it's been a it's been a potential target by the county to consolidate because of that and a lot of people think it's because they're trying to get that money so um, a lot of action are go going on that board they just had a general manager turnover so I, I again I'm just kind of interested a little bit more and, and I'm open I just want to kind of get a perspective of uh, you know if you guys wouldn't mind I hope I'm not putting you on the spot but I I think it's a good opportunity either way for either one of you well I'll respond um, I agree I feel that it's really important to our community that the representative to vector control give monthly reports. Um, they can either be verbal, uh, as Council Member 
uh, Alice Jemsa did. She always gave them verbally, and when she was no longer on the council, she came and gave a report every month. Or they can be a uh, written report, and the agenda and the minutes, the entire agenda and everything is always online uh, prior to their meetings, and it would be very easy for whoever is the representative to forward that to each of the council members. So they would be aware of what's on the agenda, they would be aware of the minutes, and all of the backup material um, without it being printed. Uh, this is something that has not been done in the past year and a half. Um, we asked for reports, and I think we got them for three months, and that was it. So I think it's really important for the community. Vector control has, um, it, it affects our community a great deal. Uh, effect, affects every community and there are the concerns Troy that you also have I know that there's been some some idea of the county taking over that and I think that they've the vector control has done a very good job and I think it's important for them to remain an, a separate entity rather than being taken over so that would be one of the or several of the reasons that I would like to um, be represented there specifically though because I think it's important that the that the meetings be reported either verbally or in printed form to the council members okay all right council member Mejia do you have a statement on this sure um, I guess my interest is the same as it would be for any other board or commission that we have the opportunity to serve on. Um, I think everyone's aware that the county was trying to do a money grab and, and they were successful in, in not allowing that to happen. Um, it's just an interest in serving the community. I know that Mr. Brimmel has come forward several times talking about issues that he's had and uh, we all at some point or another have I'm sure reached out to the city manager or past city managers to see if we couldn't be the go-between because it seems like when these issues come forward, no one wants to take responsibility and then the residents left with no resolution. So I think my interest in this was merely because uh, I think that it needs to be um, having someone that's a little bit more aggressive and, and, and um, supportive of the residents. Not that our past uh, representative has not been, nor was Alice, but I think that uh, we need to step it up just a little bit and that's my interest. Do, do either one of you guys have interest in um, going forward and representing our city on SCAG? I think Marilyn had said she was interested in that. I thought, I thought you were on the SCAG board. No, I haven't been on SCAG since April of last year, I think it was. Um, that was an appointed position by the, by the president of the board at the time. I see. And I think, weren't you interested in the regional council seat? I was, but it seems as though that's not going to be up for quite some time, right? No, April. Yeah. 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 So this is a little bit more local, so I would be interested more so in Vector than SCAG. Mayor, if I may. Go ahead. Have a chance. Okay, so um, kind of, uh, I, I agree with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Edgar about it should be a council member, and, um, you know, kind of let's, let's kind of face reality here. There's three of us that are going to be here for the full two-year term. So without, you know, kind of prognosticating anything on the next uh, year election, but that'll be you, Marilyn, and you can. So I would think that those would make you probably least um, desirable for being our representative on the board if we want to have an elected sitting council member on the Vector Control Board. So um, I'll kind of reiterate, I think uh, Jerry uh, would be the one that would be here for the term and uh, would fall within that two years. And again, I'll just reaffirm my uh, nomination. All right. I thought that, uh, Jerry, did you nominate yourself? No, Warren nominated me. And I asked if it was appropriate for me to second. But, but I will say uh, I'm, I'm willing to not vote for myself because this has a stipend, so I'm going to leave it to the rest of you to decide who you would like to represent, and there'll be no hard feelings. So you're abstaining from the vote? Yes. <clears throat> okay. We have a motion and a second for uh, Council Member Mejia to be our representative to uh, Vector Control. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Hmm. I'm gonna say no. All right. I think we have a 2-2 vote on that one. All right, is there another motion? 
I'll make a motion uh, for uh, Marilyn. Okay. And uh, is there a second to that motion? You know what? Um, I think this is a little bit foolish, and I will take back my vote, and I will vote for Jerry. Yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, put a motion on the table for uh, Jerry for the vector control. And uh, is there a second to that motion? I don't think we need to. I changed my vote. Uh, I think we still have to have a second, don't we? We still have to have a second on it. We have a new motion by Mayor Pro Tem Edgar, so is there a second for the motion? I'll second the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Councilmember Mejia will be the new uh, representative to the vector control for a two year term. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Moving on to item number 10, conference and meeting report, Joint Powers, I'm sorry, California Joint Powers Insurance Authority Annual Risk Forum. And this is going to be presented by, I believe, Warren Kuzumoto, who attended the Joint Powers Insurance Annual Risk Forum in Indian Wells, California on October 26th through 28th. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did uh, go there uh, represent, representing the city and attending the uh, various uh, breakout sessions uh, along, I think, with uh, Anita uh, Agramonte was there, and she attended separate sessions. But I just wanted to uh, make this written report to you uh, and submit it for your uh, reading pleasure, and then uh, please receive and file this report. All right, bringing it back to the council again. Council Member Edgar, do you have any questions on it? No, I would uh, just thank uh, Councilmember Kuzmoto for uh, putting together the report. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> you know, Councilmember Kuzmoto, I, I hope that uh, when we get to our budgeting session, I, I know there's a lot of issues that we have with um, how we paid into the schedule for this. Uh, and, you know, it, it's interesting. We're looking at our policy of how we're going to treat our reserves. And, uh, you know, basically that's a factor of risk mm -hmm. and uh, the insurance levels. and. Um, you know, as we get ready to go into uh, budgeting, I just would be interested, uh, maybe from your perspective, when we get on this to talk a little, it's about a $400,000 a year payment. Mm -hmm. And uh, just uh, obviously with uh, city manager turnover, um, if you can just kind of maintain the kind of point of reference on that, it'd be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I've got a question for you. Um, some of the things that you went over in the, uh, in the sessions was uh, liability updates and uh, is there a standing on that how do they how do they stand right now on I'll, I'll uh, confess I don't remember <laughs> there's so much information no, I, can, I can go back and consult my notes and uh, certainly uh, provide those to you because no, um, so the, you know it's just was there anything that blatantly stood out to you well th a lot of it that I recall it was more of a case study type of um, uh, information so they would uh, describe what, were, what was happening in uh, what, what had happened in other agencies and other uh, uh, insurance uh, coverage and how we might protect ourselves from those type of risks so that was I think the, uh, the by and large the big approach the general approach on uh, the sessions the breakout sessions they had moderators they had panels and they provided a case study all right very good the the other thing was too managing social media that sort of stood out I'm trying to figure out where that came into it do you remember anything at all on that one? Social, yeah, social. I remember that uh, it's the um, uh, your Twitter account, your Facebook accounts, uh, what you might say, how we might inadvertently create a Brown Act uh, violation by doing something. So we have we have to be careful. Well, I think our staff has to be careful on what they communicate out, and uh, that was the real message I got from that social media. Yeah. All right. And that was one of the messages that came out of Sacramento too when I was up there a couple of years ago. That. Uh, most of the social media, it's best not to Twitter. It's best not to uh, make any any statements at all on any blogs or anything at all that would uh, really jeopardize what you're doing and jeopardize the city as far as opinions go. Okay. All right, Councilmember Mejia, any questions? No, just to say thank you to Anita for going and taking care of the city and Warren for the report out. It's uh, it's great to just have a little synopsis of it, and if we have any questions, we can come to you um, for more information. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Mayor. All right. Council Member uh, 
Kuzimoto, I think you've already made your statement. Yep. We'll <laughs> leave you at that. Okay. Council Member Poe. Um, <clears throat> again, thank you, uh, Warren, for the uh, report. And thank you, Anita, for going and watching for us. All right. This is a uh, simply recommendation to, uh, to file the report. I'll make a motion to receive and file this report. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed? All right. City Council annou announcements. Um, at this point, any City Council member may also report on any item specifically described in the agenda or interest in the community. Uh, Council Member Edgar. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple items. Uh, one item on here was the, uh, I did attend the Orange County uh, Sanitation District Board meeting last Wednesday. Um, making a comment to the question by Jody Schloss, uh, citizen of Los Alamitos. Uh, she asked the question about uh, what had happened last week and three weeks prior to that, Orange County Sanitation District Board vote. Um, there's th basically a labor agreement for the non-represented uh, folks within the Orange County Sand District uh, came up for vote. This is 35 folks that's the management and unrepresented. Um, had the vote, uh, like I said, uh, last month. These are monthly meetings and the vote was conducted incorrectly. Uh, the city attorney or the attorney for the agency had uh, had us go through and have a vote instead of bringing it back into the public. And uh, so we fixed that this last meeting on Wednesday. The vote that I had placed when we first went through that was a yes. The vote that I placed last week was a no. Uh, rationale to the Jody Schloss and the council was um, I'm, I struggled with that vote the first time through because that vote is for the management of Orange County Sanitation District. Uh, one of the challenges is that um, in there specifically within their PERS contribution or their OSERS, which is their retirement or pension, uh, there was an opportunity to see if there was uh, an area that we would be able to potentially work through uh, one more shot to see if we can get a little bit more. This group leads the example of what happens for the union contracts coming down the road, so it was a real opportunity for pension reform. Um, that didn't happen the first time through when this item was brought back because of the procedural problem that they had. Um, what I was hoping to be able to do is to uh, see if maybe we could take one more shot at it uh, to be able to look at an area of opportunity for the pension reform. And it, again, one, not to penalize the staff because they've done tremendous stuff. Uh, my focus was mainly to say, hey, here's an opportunity because there was a procedural problem. Uh, there was focus on this from the county, and it was a real opportunity, I thought, to uh, potentially slow that process down. This will be the last labor group that we'll probably meet with before we run into a big problem on the Sanitation District Board, which is what we're going to be dealing um, in the next year or two with, uh, with uh, potential rate increases. So uh, this would have been a group that symbolically would have helped lead by example and uh, focusing on uh, really in the pension reform issue very specifically had to do with the contribution. Uh, how much do the employees pay for their portion of the, uh, the pension? And, uh, and that's uh, the reason for the different vote. Um, and if there's any other questions, I'd be glad to answer them. A uh, couple other things. I represented the city at the ACCOC or the league uh, city selection vote. So within that, uh, we voted uh, that each city sends representatives to this uh, league uh, evening that uh, basically each mayor of each city votes for their district for different seats, like on the Orange County Transportation Authority, uh, et cetera. That was the vote that uh, we had taken in action as the city council uh, to try to protect our seed on the um, Rivers and Mountains Conservancy, the state of California, a project that our Public Works Department, our city manager has been very active in. And more importantly, uh, this council has uh, continued to push uh, to uh, make sure that we have representation and that we try and get a project done. Uh, in that uh, discussion, we had, uh, um, I had one other person that was interested in uh, going out for that position, uh, but uh, had an opportunity to state the case of why the city was focused on getting that and laid out that we are the uh, la one of the last three projects that's uh, focused for uh, Rivers and Mountains in or Orange County. We've got about $1.4 million on the line specifically for Los Alamitos, and that we as a city wanted to continue our participation on that board so that we could uh, ensure that we can work closely with that board and with 
Edison to get our project done by June 2012. Uh, at that, uh, the other representative, I believe, from the city of Berea withdrew his nomination and allowed us to have it. And uh, so we were successful in securing our seat on the Rivers and Mountains Conservancy. Uh, the State of City, uh, State of the City luncheon uh, participated or went to that last week. Uh, Mayor, I, I really appreciate uh, you getting up there and giving your State of the City along with uh, the uh, representatives uh, from the uh, school district. And, you know, it was very helpful to see where. Uh, the city's going where the school district's going and uh, it was just great to see a partnership. We had great participation as a member of the chamber. I was uh, just uh, it was unbelievable. So it was one of the best uh, participated uh, state of the city since probably when Maryland when you uh, did yours. So I've, I thought that was really good. Um, and then uh, lastly, the uh, GWR uh, groundwater replenishment system that they're talking about a letter of support. Um, you know, the, if that's something that the council's interested in supporting, then they asked very specifically if they could uh, get a letter of participation. Uh, as Jerry had uh, outlined, it definitely um, down the road has uh, potential rate impacts. Uh, again, I, I think that there's two components of this to just keep in mind as the public is that the groundwater replenishment system definitely has uh, rate effects as it pertains to the cost per acre, which hits our water bill, but is passed through on the Golden State water. The rate effects that, Jerry, I wasn't sure if you were meaning to, to talk about was uh, when the Orange County Sanitation District voted for rates, those show up on your property tax bill, and those were in a five-year graduated step uh, to really make up for a process called secondary treatment that feeds the groundwater replenishment. And uh, and so you've got two organizations, uh, as Jerry had put it uh, very accurately, or working very close together, kind of cause and effect. As you had one organization that uh, that you know that had to basically carry the burden of capital assets of being able to build the capability of feeding the groundwater replenishment. You've got the groundwater replenishment now running at 70% uh, capacity. Then they need to potentially uh, go higher. Before you would uh, just blank uh, go and put a letter of support together though I, I would encourage everybody I'm also on the steering committee for the golden uh, for the GWRS uh, board and as an alternate and so I attend most of those meetings um, you know it, it definitely makes sense to be able to get a blended water rate that's cheaper mm -hmm. um, but but again I guess rate wise too um, it's just something I think you got to go into knowing that you know there's a potential rate increase coming behind it uh, when we're actively trying to lobby against Golden State Water and its rated uh, increase we you know, might want to try and have a uniform approach to the way we handle handled these types of situations I say that knowing that when we deal with this with Orange County Sand District we're gonna also have have to be consistent mm -hmm. um, and uh, for that I, I if I'm still on that board I will continue to bring back that uh -huh. issue and really get a vote of our board's perspective on where that vote is and not carry that one myself um, so with that uh, I think that's all I have mayor I just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving over the holiday um, and uh, in and just I hope that uh, a lot of the uh, families uh, and, and everybody take the time off, reflect, and be thankful for everything that we've been blessed with. Thank you. Thank you. All right, a week ago Sunday, I uh, attended a uh, Eagle Scout Awards ceremony over at Cottonwood Christian, and uh, I thought I had the two Eagle Scouts names, and I don't, but uh, believe me, they got a great deal of recognition at that, uh, at that event. And uh, so congratulations to them both, to their parents that put in a great deal of hard work and to both of them too. I've attended the Budget and Finance Committee for the Orange County Fire Authority and uh, really nothing to report out of that except that uh, we're fighting to make sure that we maintain the levels of uh, safety that we need in all of our communities. And then I also attended the Orange County Fire Authority Director's Meeting. A uh, major topic was the uh, John Wayne Airport and how much safety is too much safety. And so that's going to be continuing on or how much safety is not enough. Uh, currently, I, my belief is that it's, uh, it's a serious concern when I see, see us cutting back on firemen and the capabilities at the airport and so 
I don't want to see that happen because uh, very seldom do planes crash on the airport. They are going to crash in a community, and that concerns me for all the communities around. Every time I look up in the sky and see a plane going over, so I want to make sure that we do have adequate coverage for all of our residents. I also attended the State of the City, and I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> since I was the one doing all the speaking. But I do want to thank staff for setting up the uh, state of the city, the chamber, and the school district. And uh, I enjoyed it. I think it was a good event and very, uh, very informational to the way it was um, set up for me to uh, present. I wanted to thank Councilmember Poe for attending the DeVita grand opening for me. I was tied up on quite a few other situations that I was taking care of. And uh, she filled in for me for that grand opening, which just happened to be on my birthday. And that was another reason that uh, I wasn't uh, going to be able to be there. And I also wanted to thank staff for fast tracking one of my favorite restaurants in the city, McDonald's. <laughs> I rely on them for my coffee. I love the new drive through I love everything that you did over there. So. Uh, for our residents in the community, if you haven't had a chance to go to McDonald's, go on over there. You know, it's it's a beautiful uh, it's a beautiful add to our community. And when you look at some of the other McDonald's restaurants, nothing against them, but ours sort of stands out. You know, as being a, a state of the art facility and the new drive-through, the new turnaround drive-through, and the parking came out perfectly. And I just it astounds me that it was done so quickly. I'd like to see other things done that quickly, too. All right. All right, and that's all I had. Moving on to Council Member Mejia. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I want to start off by saying you did an exceptional job at the State of the City. I was proud to be from Los Alamitos. You represented us extremely well. Um, also, I would like to uh, ask the City Manager, uh, do we need to go through a process to have the stipend amounts for the Council Members for Boards and Commissions included I mean it's, it's reportable we can certainly do it I just have to learn what they are and, okay. and get the things but yeah that's certainly could. I just wasn't sure what the yeah. process was thank you um, also Angie I hate to put you on the spot but I was reading in the weekly about the um, deal that we have through Johnny Rebs if you have been a past <clears throat> or uh, going to be a um, uh, a race I can't think of if you're registering for the race on the base mm -hmm. if you've already registered or you've been a past member of that if you can tell us a little bit more about that Sure. Thank you, Council Member Mejia. Um, we have a new partnership for the Race on the Base, and that's with Johnny Re Reb's Restaurant. Uh, and actually, uh, they are providing a tremendous amount of food. Uh, I'll tell you about the race, and then I'll tell you about uh, how it affects past and future participants. They are providing um, breakfast and lunch for all um, race participants. Uh, volunteers, uh, JFTB personnel, and staff the day of the race. This is uh, an in, uh, just a donation to the race valued at $25,000. Um, and then they are selling food the, the night before the race at Packet Pickup and during the race. So to all spectators. Um, so we wanted to continue to enhance the environment at the race, to um, have people uh, bring their families, bring their friends, bring their neighbors, and enjoy the experience there. And this is uh, a major step in that direction. Now, um, Johnny Rebs is interested. They have uh, uh, restaurants in the area, one in uh, Bellflower, one in Orange, and so we're kind of right in the middle of their market, and they want to uh, invite anyone who has a, uh, a race bib or a medal or anything, a t-shirt um, from past races to visit their restaurants and get 15% off of their total uh, restaurant bill uh, at any time. So that's before the race, after the race. Um, they are family owned. They're excited to do business with us, and we're thrilled with the partnership. 
Thank you, Angie. I just thought that was such a neat thing for anybody who's been involved in the past or plans to be involved. And it's great for the business also because it's, it's a win-win situation. So thank you for expounding on that for me. Um, I wanted to bring this forward because I thought it was, it was kind of funny. It's an um, article that's from the Weekly, and it's an I-class that the city is offering. And for those of you who are not very good, I know all the kids out in the audience can work your iPhones like no problem, but we old people, we don't know how to do it. But So the city's going to be offering a class, and um, it's just something that if you're interested in learning how to maximize your use of your phone, it, it's a great thing. It's also for iPads. So if you're interested, you can call the city, and they can give you the information for that. And then the last thing I have to uh, talk about tonight, because I want to be very quickly, Troy, that's exactly what I, I was talking about. When we, Even though I support the groundwater replenishment, and I think what they're doing is great, we're talking about uh, water increases for the residents. We're talking about uh, electricity increases for the residents. Um, the recyclables are not part of our trash contract, so that's something else that's going to be an additional cost. And then if we add on the groundwater, I think that we're just going to be um, putting our residents at a position where um, they're already struggling financially, some of them, and have these extra taxes added on. It's just going to be potentially the straw that breaks the camel's back. So before we move forward with it, and once again, it's not that I don't support it. I think it's a great thing. Uh, and like I said, I've been able to go on the tour. If you're interested, you should do so. It might explain to you better um, what they're doing. But uh, before we sign any letter collectively or individually, I think we as you said, I mean, a united front, and not only that, but being consistent with saying we don't support the raises uh, at this time. And other than that, happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy your uh, families and your turkeys, and um, we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you. City Manager, uh, any letter that they're requesting, you will bring it back to us before. Well, a letter. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Kuzumoto. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, just, Angie, you, you left off one of the Johnny Rebs. I think the original one is in Long Beach on Atlantic, Atlantic, and it's in a real seedy looking area. You talk about mm -hmm. character. I, I've eaten there it's many like times. Roadhouse. It, yeah, it does. Um, I've eaten two of the three, at, at two of the three places, and the one in Long Beach uh, is really the one with a lot of character. Um, let's see, I uh, did want to mention about the uh, Los Al High School girls volleyball team, uh, Division One AA champions. They went through undefeated through the uh, playoffs, and they're on to state which is kind of good and kind of bad. My son plays basketball, and, and their winning disrupts the basketball uh, practice <laughs> schedule. <laughs> but uh, congratulations to the uh, girls' um, volleyball and uh, Coach Huber. Uh, I, did, I attended the State of the City uh, as well, and it was really a fun event. There were a lot of people there, and uh, um, I got quite noisy at a couple times where I think um, uh, Dr. Kropp, who was, um, I guess, emceeing the uh, um, luncheon really had to struggle to quiet everybody down. That's how, uh, I think, how energized everyone was. It was yep. really a lot of fun. Um, one of the things I, I've been off and on talking with um, the city manager about uh, solar power and uh, what that means to uh, us as perhaps residents and businesses in our city might uh, look to switching over to that. I think the price point is becoming uh, very competitive. That's something that we need to kind of look at uh, from a city policy standpoint because um, we generate or we, we derive some um, income for the city to run the city from utility tax. And if we're not um, using utility off the grid and it's not getting taxed, then I think we're going to look at a, a different um, um, business model that we'd have to kind of look at. So that's something I think we need to look at. I um, don't know how we would want to uh, go forward with this, but something to be mindful of. Um, you know, the, uh, the future is going to happen. There are a lot of uh, technologies out there that will. Uh, change the way we're going to do business. So just want to uh, plant that seed in everyone's mind that we probably want to look at that. And uh, I would like to um, all engage with um, Anita and then uh, with uh, Janelle from Edison to uh, kind of get a sense of what they see as the future. Because we also have electric cars that will also be mm -hmm. uh, both um, presumably pulling power off the grid as well as putting power back on the grid uh, during uh, the times when they're not being driven. Um, there's uh, that uh, potential as well. Okay, um, one of the things um, I, I did want to ask the city attorney, um, uh, about a year ago, uh, in November 15th, uh, when the uh, lawsuit came up from the plaintiffs, the Citizens for a Fair Trash Contract happened, um, you all met in closed session. 
the council did, and uh, you came out and announced that um, the city was going to defend against the lawsuit and it was going to be uh, paid for by CDS. So in my mind, uh, and I know I've asked this before, but can you explain to the public, because I'm still not clear as to um, how the city is not whole in terms of being reimbursed for um, any legal fees that we incur to defend against a lawsuit by the Citizens for a Fair Trash Contract? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. The city pays for the defense costs and CDS is obligated to reimburse the city for the city's costs. Okay. And so things like um, uh, their attorney's fees, our attorney's fees, um, um, the, uh, because of the uh, first cause of action that says the city uh, violated the uh, code, presumably we would have to pay uh, city uh, or their attorney fees. Wouldn't that be reimbursed by the, um, the, uh, the trash hauler under the terms of the contract? Um, neither. Th there's been no determination by the court as to responsibility for attorney's fees, but um, that's certainly the position that we would take that if there is any okay. responsibility for attorney's fees that it's the uh, waste hauler who should bear that responsibility pursuant to their agreement with us. Thank you. And uh, with that, back to you, Mayor. Very good. Um, city Manager, I know the question from uh, Councilmember Kuzumoto was about solar power, but I also know the City of Cyprus is looking into this very extensively right now, too. So I think they've already done a great deal of work on this, haven't they? They have, and they're continuing to do so to look at the impacts of that. They're actually setting up some different kind of solar stations and stuff as well, and I've talked to them. As far as gauging what the economic impact is, I'm not sure they have much better idea, but they're working on it, and I'll continue to talk to them, and we'll see if we can get information that's worthwhile to the council. I know I received one of the reports about yeah. three months ago, and it just wasn't to a point yet where yeah. You could determine, you know, the, the correct way to go on to it. Well, I mean, and, and, and Councilmember Kuzumoto's point is well taken. As solar power becomes more feasible and prices definitely are dropping in real dollar terms, you know, at what percentage of, of businesses mainly, not just residences, will do that. There will be a percentage. On the other hand, if you're driving electric cars, it's going to pull power off the grid. I, I don't know, you know, where that all balances out. And that's something that really SCE should report on. They probably have a better feel for that and what the, the penetration rates are going to be in the future. And I just haven't spoken with them yet. Very good. All right, going on to Council Member Poe. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry that I was not able to attend um, the State of the City. I heard that you did an excellent job, and the staff did a great job. I was able to go with our city manager to the grand opening of DeVita. Um, it was um, a long time coming, and um, the facility is very, very nice. Uh, they had a wonderful uh, luncheon, actually, and uh, ribbon cutting, which we participated in. Uh, the facility is uh, very well done. I have a thumbnail uh, bit of knowledge about, um, about dialysis as my father went through it and a close friend. And um, I have to say the facility there is top of the, top of the line. And we will have someone. We invited them to come and speak. Um, and tell a little bit about the facility, and they weren't able to come tonight, but I guess they're coming next at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. We uh, were able to really go through and get a, a complete um, uh, tour of the facility, and it's going to be great for anyone that is unfortunate enough to have to, to be in need of dialysis. Uh, and they actually also will be taking care of people who are able to do dialysis at home and just have to go there once a week. Um, so as I said, it, it's, it's a real asset to our, I feel, for, for the community, for those that will um, be able to come close and not have to travel a distance to go for, for this treatment. Um, I also would like to uh, congratulate the girls' volleyball uh, team they did an absolutely outstanding job, and we have made an arrangement at the museum so that when any team or group from the high school uh, wins awards and so on, they will automatically send a picture to us and a write-up so that we can put it in the museum so that people that come to see the, uh, come visit the museum will be able to see, 
you know, what's going on as kind of as it's happening. So we're looking forward to getting them inducted into the museum. I um, had talked to our city manager. I know that during our budget time, we discussed at great length uh, Christmas decorations. We did. And we did a little looking into that too, and uh, we'll finish up first. Then, well, but yeah. I I've had a lot of people in the community um, approach me and say, "There, are we going to have Christmas decorations this year?" And it is something that does make our community look good. People in the community like it. And I know that our revenues are up a little bit. And my question to our city manager was to look into it to see if there was any way that it would be feasible for us to have Christmas decorations this year. Well, Angie almost melted in a pool of sweat when I mentioned it to her Friday <laughs> afternoon. So, uh, but I will say, we looked at this, and we're looking at about $23,000 to the decorations this year. Um, and the timing is going to be difficult if we choose to do it. What, what I would, it, because I think we need to rethink the way we do the decorations a little bit, and basically what I'm saying is if we're going to do it, let's do it right. Um, the way they have been done in the past, the $23,000 gets us what looks like a sparse look on the Christmas decorations on Contella. So my sense is that, yes, revenues were hopeful that they are going to remain up this year. Um, and if we're going to do it, I think it would be better off to move it off till next year and actually, frankly, and I almost hate to say it, is increase the budget to provide for additional decorations on two of three poles rather than one of three at least so it looks more dense and it does make an impact. What I, what I really don't want to do is have an underwhelming Christmas decoration display and yet set aside $23,000 to do it and, and rush the job. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for, for lack of a better term without going into too great a detail, I'm happy to agendize it but I think I'd rather put this off till next year and talk about it in mid-year budget. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. uh, I know that it's very late it is. in and the year. Yeah. And that would be a problem, but I, I certainly didn't recall that it was going to cost that much for yeah. decorations. Yeah. I guess that's the reason we didn't do it to begin with. Uh, so if we could put that on the mid-year agenda, sure. I'd, I'd, I'd be happy. Well, you don't recall it because what happened was there was some discussion about using existing decorations, which brought the cost down to something less than $10,000. Right. But upon inspection of the existing decorations that we had, they weren't in very good shape. So the plan was if we were going to do anything, it brings it up to a, you know the amount mm -hmm. of over $20,000. So. And we discussed this before that yeah. uh, we might be able to get some sponsorship of exactly. decorations by people in, in the community. So, all right. Well, I just thought it was worth trying. Um, I guess, um, Jerry, I was a little bit um, confused by your comment that we don't have recyclables in our trash contract because we do have recycle in the trash. We have green recycle bin. I, I, I think I was a little confused too, but what I th after about 10 seconds of reflection, I think what you're referring to was the roll-offs, right? Was mm -hmm. that part? Okay. So the roll-offs with construction and potential construction recyclables would not mm -hmm. be included. Those are handled individually outside. Yeah. Okay. And um, let me see here. I guess I've covered everything, except I would like to wish everyone in the community uh, a lovely holiday week. Um, Thanksgiving is something that all families, I think, look forward to. And it's a time to, to be together with family and friends and just enjoy each other. And uh, so I wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Edgar had one additional question, I believe. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I guess I just wanted a second chance, uh, uh, Warren, on your point on the, uh, the solar energy. Um, I, I had an opportunity to see a demonstration project. The city of Brea, uh, Chevron had uh, done a, um, I, I'm not sure if it was a demonstration project or it was actually uh, subsidized somewhat by Chevron, but they, they provided kind of a funding and they did a, a complete green project for Brea, able to provide a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, it had a break even point of like 20 years. You're talking uh, the community center? Uh, yeah, part Bray, of it was in Bray the community center. I'm familiar with that. I go up there every Friday, and uh, it's a yeah, it's a really interesting, big, expansive project. So no, I'm I'm talking about the home users. Oh, <laughs> that's the ones that we in in the future. Those are the ones that are going to impact oh. utility mm -hmm. taxes as the utility use goes down as they generate electricity. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have that source of revenue. That's that's where I'm worried about. 
Okay. Not not for the city to go out and get into the power generating business. Uh, yeah, I don't no, see that that's, uh, that, that's <clears throat> not uh, for the city too long a term. Okay. Now that, that I was just curious, I also uh, wanted to make everybody aware we're looking uh, to potentially have a, the elected officials group meeting next week. Uh, Jeff, I was just curious if you have an update on this. This has to do with uh, Seal Beach is coordinating the effort, and we're looking at doing it either the 28th or the 29th. Okay. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you, Mayor. If I may, just. Marilyn had brought up a great idea. I've heard that also about the holiday decorations. Is there any way we could potentially do like a tree lighting ceremony? It would cost a lot less. I'm not saying for this year, but something that would, you know, you know, you're shaking your head. But there was an event. There was an event that we used to do over at Cottonwood Park, right. where they uh, public works would go out and dig a big hole, and there'd be a bonfire. And you would think maybe not that many people would come. There was at least a couple of hundred people. <laughs> They brought hot chocolate. We sang songs. So I do think that there's a potential for a um, a community event yeah. if we can't afford if we can't afford that. Yeah, I was shaking my head in that I agree with you. We don't have yeah. it now, and it's 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 kind of a good community event, a community drawing event on that. Right. And I think we certainly could discuss that often as well. I just thought in support of Marilyn's idea, yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear the it. same yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And Marilyn, I think you had to. Yes. Add well, on to that. thank you for um, bringing this up. There will be a community event on um, December, Thursday, December the 8th, and Thursday, December the 15th at St. Isidore Historical Plaza on the uh, picnic at the plaza. There is going to be um, a Christmas tree. There's going to be sing-along uh, with carols, so on and so forth. So there's, it's a good opportunity for people that would like to enjoy that kind of thing, bring their children, where uh, the children are going to be able to dec help decorate the tree. And on the 15th, uh, tentatively, we have a concert, um, a Christmas concert um, scheduled. So there is a couple of things there that will <coughs> that people can come to uh, if they want to, to come to a community event during the Christmas season. Perfect. Thank Very you. Very good. All right, moving on. Um, items from the city manager, anything at all? No, I was just talking to the city attorney about potential tree lighting stuff. So. <laughs> all right. <laughs> city attorney, any items at all? All right, we are going to move on to item 12, which is closed session. Uh, the first part of it is going to be public employment titled city manager, interim city manager, government code section 54957. The second part of it is going to be involved in existing litigation, and that is uh, GC 54956.9A. And we will come back out and adjourn the meeting after that. So thank you all for being here. If you want to wait around, we'll be back.